Welcome to the WRW podcast where we discuss and explore the world of women's writing. I'm Anand. I'm Sammi. I'm Devi. And I'm Abhi. And today's podcast episode is about Marjane Satrape's Persepolis. But before we get into the episode, we'd like to draw attention to some of the fundraisers and resources about the current situation in Iran that we found out while researching for this episode. Uh, they will be linked in the show notes. Please stay informed and contribute if you can. Thank you for listening. And as always, we have an important question from Sami. Pause a second while I make this up right now. <laughs> um, what was your favorite food to eat growing up? Like a snack food or a meal food? Any kind of food. Okay, Devi. I I don't... Well, if I had this growing up... I mean, I did have it. I don't know ages, guys. But I just... I, did I grow up? But there's this, like, a brand in India called Haldi Rams. And they have this, like, thing called Tasty Nuts. <laughs> and, oh my god, I... Uh, my you dad have to be grown up to have tasty nuts. I mean, you have to be very grown up to have tasty nuts. My dad used to like buy those um, when I was like 12 and I would only get like a little bit of it because I wasn't supposed to have spicy, you know, that masala type yeah. food. But these days, whenever I go to the grocery store nearby my house, I, I always buy a packet of tasty nuts and I finish it within the same day and I get horrible, like, you know, body problems the next day. <laughs> like, okay, oh my God, this is actually funny. I think I should mention this. Last semester, before like our last final exam we had like a bag of tasty nuts and then I, and our final exam was like our open elective and Anna and I we, and Abhi right we had taken um, lifestyle disorders and one of the chapters there was cancer and I developed like horrible sores in my mouth and I was like convinced it was oral cancer <laughs> it was, I was convinced I had oral yeah, cancer I stood for a consultation for you and thank you so much Anna's sister um it ended up not being oral cancer, but it was still very concerning because I couldn't eat anything. But would I still have tasty nuts? Yes, I would. I Thank you. want to try tasty nuts. You should bring some. I would bring. I would bring you tasty nuts, Sami. <laughs> what about your favorite food? Okay. Um, so my my favorite food growing up, I I was and am a very boring person in terms of food preferences. <laughs> I used to like like porridge. Like kai ganji, like mm-hmm. coconut porridge. It's not even. It's like rice, not you, not even real coconut. Like that powder, pu- and then you put water, and then you put bella, like jaggery, and salt, and then you mix it and you cook it for like three minutes. You boil it, and then that was my favorite food because it was sweet and salty and carbs, and it was like soup. You had a very refined <laughs> palate. <laughs> Sorry, like, that's incredible. <laughs> Yeah, so that was that was great. It's still my comfort food. I eat it when I'm sick. Yeah, Abhi. Okay, I used to have these like um, it's called thekwa and it's I don't know if you guys know it, but it's like made out of jaggery and it's mostly like made in festivals mm-hmm. and it's like really tasty because you like you can either like bake it or you can like fry it and it's like sweet but like not too sweet and I will make you guys have it someday. Yay. But it's really good and I used to love that. I still love it. My mom makes them and oh my god, they're, they're really good. But if I had to say like like some junk food, it'd probably be like Maggie or something because I'm Real. not very healthy. <laughs> but it's not tasty nuts, so. <laughs> it's not tasty. It's not tasty nuts. Okay, Anna? Um, okay, so if I have to pick a snack, do you guys know Yan Yan? Yeah. Yeah, that. And in Delhi... Um, when I was young, I think each packet used to come for like 90 rupees mm-hmm. and we used to buy it and my sister and I would like sort of fight over it and then eat it. And then we also ate a lot of um, sour punk. Mm. Is that the... That's the... You know, weirdly the guy on the cover of that looks like one of the characters. Yeah, he looks like... Guys. You know, Momo. that... <laughs> I he looks never... Momo? Momo. Yes. He looks like I Momo. I haven't seen a sour <laughs> will... she's talking about. So I, I, I will, I, know, I will but... pull this up. <laughs> sour punk. Um, guys, this is this is the sour punk dude. 
Oh, he does. He does oh look like God, Momo from Persepolis. from Persepolis. A character we hate, but we'll get into that later. Thank you, Anna, for sharing your favorite food. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Marjan Satrapi is a French Iranian illustrator and filmmaker. Apart from a number of illustration projects, she is most well known for her graphic novel Persepolis, which is a semi-autobiographical story about her experiences growing up in a politically volatile Iran at the time of the Islamic Revolution. Um so this is a story that spans about four volumes which are divided into Persepolis 1 and 2. So one is called um The Story of a Childhood, which is basically about her experiences growing up in Iran. and uh, also i think her going to austria and yeah. so her going to austria yeah. um and persepolis 2 is called the story of her return and it's basically about how her experiences when she's older in austria and then when she comes back to iran mm-hmm. so the context in which we all i think most of us were yes. exposed to this is because in the first semester of our classes um which ended up not being our, our first, first semester of classes because of weird <laughs> syllabus country thing real yeah. thank you india thank you. <laughs> Um so we had this general english class where this is the core text that we were doing for that point of time i don't think we did anything after this because everything no, got cancelled we had canceled. like two classes on persepolis and then it ended so yeah which were like very interesting mm-hmm. classes mm-hmm. i sat and did this whole thing in like one afternoon anyway so um let's start with the question shall we Uh okay so first of all I sort of want to know what do you guys think about the book and is there are there like any specific panels or illustrations that you really liked any particular sections in general what do you guys think Devi So for those of you who haven't uh, read Persepolis yet um it's primarily like drawn in black and white and one interesting thing I noticed is that the dominant color in a lot of panels is black like the background is black and the characters would be in white and um this this enables for some very like silly cartoonish drawings like some me just just before we started recording she showed me a panel of like little margie she was called margie when she was a child and yeah. i think her parents still call her margie i think we can call her margie as in like the, as character, the character in the yeah. book yeah margie just being like lifted up by her dad and she looks like very funny it, it wasn't her dad it was like an uncle that was oh it was uncle anush no no it okay uncle. it was some yeah, uncle dad. some uncle and then her eyes are like bulging out it, it's So it's funny, so cute. I, I love Margie, and at the same time, this like stark black and white enables for some very like striking panels. For example, there is this one panel where uh, she was talking about a political prisoner being cut up, and the body is in white. There's no blood, but the body is completely like cut up, and there's a background of black, and it's really striking when that happens. um and i think one of my other favorite panels was um there were a, a bunch of political prisoners who were about to be they were executed her fa- after her return okay here's the thing guys i accidentally read persepolis 2 because the book i was reading it was just called the complete persepolis and i thought oh, okay this is persepolis 1 and it did not mention persepolis 1 and persepolis 2 i thought that entire yeah, like 3 4 there's, there's yeah. no like yeah. numbers, like numbers like on anything. my version there's no numbers yeah and i thought man 346 pages persepolis 2 must be huge and then i ended up realizing that persepolis 2 was in those 346 pages and i literally read all that like in the span of a day because you know marjan satrapi is just that good of like a illustrator and a writer but um yeah in the second book Her, when she returns to Iran her dad's telling her about some political prisoners mm-hmm. a huge number of them who have been executed and the panel where they're shown it's mostly in black but their silhouettes just their silhouettes are in white and mm-hmm. it's it's gorgeous and it's really striking and it really like puts across the intensity of certain scenes sami yeah i think i enjoyed a lot of the things of the narrative style mm-hmm. because the way that historical events are portrayed are just very stark there's not a lot of nuance in the way that she's describing okay there was this revolution and then there was this thing and that thing it's not it's not like uh marji is sitting at home and then su- suddenly there's some noise and she doesn't understand like she's like no there's some revolt and then this and that but 
because the historical facts are placed so starkly the, you get to interpret a lot of things about the relationships between the characters mm-hmm. and their perspectives i think that becomes the aspect that's very nuanced i think i'd like to get into this on like later questions um but i enjoyed the kind of mixed up complicated un understandable perspectives that it gave me about this time period that i did not know anything about on a much lighter note um the number one most distracting thing for me while i'm reading a book is when there's many languages mm-hmm. and there are many languages in this book so i read this in our class uh so the book is originally in french mm-hmm. and i know french so when we were prescribed this in our general english class i went and i read it in <laughs> french yeah. and then um uh so while we were preparing for this i read part it's also divided into four parts sometimes so i read the first of four parts in french and the second and half of the third in english mm-hmm. and i also have a kannada version of this book <laughs> and also at some points there's uh, some of the writing is in like farsi and i don't know farsi mm-hmm. i know like three words of farsi because i had an iranian friend in school um but also at some points they're speaking german and i'm yeah. studying german yeah. <laughs> so i was like very like sometimes i would be like oh my god i know this language <laughs> i mean all the time i was like that so that was really fun mm-hmm. um through but also kind of irrelevant to the story itself <laughs> but i enjoyed yeah. it all in all um abhi i mean um when we first read this book i because i don't really read like books with illustra- so many illustrations because it's like difficult to focus because mm-hmm. i'll just be looking at the pictures and then i'll have to zoom in because i have bad eyesight i'll have to <laughs> keep zooming in into the pictures to see what's really happening but i really like it i mean the illustrations are really fun and then there's some like really funny panels just in the first chapter i think there's the um, panel where they're like first given the veil and then nobody's taking it seriously <laughs> somebody's like playing rope with it somebody's yeah. covering her, her <laughs> face with funny. it yeah. that was funny i like the humor aspect of it otherwise it's like it's not that serious but it's also like you know talking about all of the stuff that's going on in iran but overall i just think it's it's easy to read and it's like you know like if even if somebody who's not that aware of the stuff that's going on like politically or like mm-hmm. younger audience can like read it easily and like gain a little bit of the like f- it. the first half of the first part can be read by younger audiences yeah, yeah. <laughs> the first half of the first part yeah i like it um yeah sami uh, yeah i had something to add on which is i already spoke about it before we started recording but there's this one part where i think french marji is a lot funnier than english <laughs> marji uh there's this part where so she considers herself to be the next prophet this is 9 year old marji and um she is reading out her rules that she's going to put in, in down in her book and rule number 8 in english it says um rule number 8 no old person should have to suffer mm-hmm. and in french she says règle numéro 8 aucune vieille n'a le droit de souffrir which means oh my god sami that's so <laughs> which means rule number 8 no old person has the right to suffer it's like your suffering is criminal you cry crying, crying. She's so it is funny. not allowed she is so funny i love i love french marji um i love french speaking iranian <laughs> marji yes yes i love french speaking marji um yes ana Um yeah one thing that i really like about reading this book is that there's so much to look at and there's so much that i want to remember that i want to record um there's this one panel that um it it's it just occurs randomly so it's uh, her mother wait uh, so maji is related to um like distantly related to the previous royal family um and her mother is telling her the story of you know how it was when she was growing up because her dad was the prince before he was like you know ah, before first. the shah that is right mm-hmm. yeah. yeah and um it's a very heavy story for her to be told but then she's just sitting there and there's a lot of her just being like oh my god my grandpa was a prince that's mm-hmm. so cool mm-hmm. and there's this panel that just comes in and then it's just her looking straight at you and saying i want to take a bath mm-hmm. and um There's another thing that I kept noticing like at least in the beginning where she just looks at you and talks 
it yeah. reminded me a lot of fleabag the way that uh, yeah. your the, like the main character just looks at you mm-hmm. and it's like her inner thoughts yeah, yeah and then it's like she's looking at you and she's talking to you which is very cool and um, i think in one of the later portions uh, when she's more of like a rebellious teenager okay mm-hmm. and yeah it's just the narrative techniques that are used in the form of images so she she asks her mom oh can i go to the basement and she's just like oh that the basement is this place where i feel you know um more at ease with myself and then she goes down and then the basement becomes like this feel for the images of like the stories that she's telling us i just think it's really cool um adding on to like what you said um about the i want to take a bath mm-hmm. panel i don't think you guys have reached this part as it's in persepolis too also like content warning for suicidal thoughts and imagery um there's a panel i mean there is a part in persepolis too where marji attempts to take her own life mm-hmm. and she attempts to do it in the bathtub mm-hmm. and now that anna is showing us that panel you know her i want to take a bath it's it's really striking because mm-hmm. half of her face is in white and the other half in black and that the knowledge about like what she is going to attempt in the future mm-hmm. makes it much more scary to me now to look at that panel and i i just think there's a lot of like good foreshadowing now looking back at it and yeah i think as a whole it's it's a really good book to reread mm-hmm. like yeah. what devi just said i yeah. mean i don't think i could have made that connection unless i read it, it again, read it again. Yeah. Yeah. i just made it mm-hmm. now yeah mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah so i mentioned that persepolis is a, a text that we did in the first semester mm-hmm. of um fake college fake college <laughs> one year of one semester of fake college right um so one of the discussions that we had around persepolis at that point was about whether a child can be a reliable narrator um and in general like this is what i also want to ask you that how do you think um marji is making sense of everything that's going around her and what do you think of how that's written in the story sami okay um so one this is a relic the start of my response is kind of boring which is the idea of reliability doesn't have anything to do with reality mm-hmm. it's just about consistency in the level of truthfulness mm-hmm. you know like if it's a fictional story how is a narrative reliable or not reliable because the story doesn't exist it's not real so in this case as well i think the way that marji tells the story to the mm-hmm. readers is she doesn't it doesn't feel like she's changing anything mm. about what's going on it like i said in the first question it's a very stark very explicit her recollection of events and in that sense i do consider her to be a reliable narrator in the sense of her representing a kind of historical event not a kind of a historical event from a child's lens the child also went through that event and i think a child's experience of that event is as real as an mm-hmm. adult's experience and uh, one thing we were studying in um psychology today was about there is this concept of i'm not going to go into too much mm-hmm. detail but the idea is that beyond the age of 12 you're in your what's called the formal operational stage where you can deal with abstract concepts but beyond a certain point you kind of get used to it and you stop thinking about it in such detail yeah, yeah. and i definitely agree with this with as adults we are a lot more biased to um accepting and understanding and processing kinds of information we tend to only listen to things that make sense to us mm-hmm. or listen to things that we want to hear and in that sense i think having a kid that has not developed this bias mm-hmm. to narrate this sort of historical event is a very important and useful insight to have mm-hmm. so i i think it's not the kind of insight that an adult would have been able to give uh, while recollecting something like a revolution or a war yeah um abhi okay so um my is i don't think i have that much of a response to this but um i do think she is reliable in some sense because like the way her illustrations depict like all the emotions on her face and everything i think that's that's really powerful and then also um 
it's spoken from the voice of like a very young girl you know and like it's more it's it's not that stark so i mean it is stark but then also there's this like um fact it is the fact that she doesn't really know what's happening all the time i guess because her family is like really well off as in more well off compared to the people that are you know struggling in yeah. iran so i don't think she sees all of the struggle mm-hmm. that's going on around in the country mm-hmm. and so um that's one thing and then also uh also the fact that she she doesn't make her childhood look better than it was but she also doesn't make it look worse mm-hmm. because like she talks about the protests and she talks about the resistance that the iranian people you know like put up and also uh, the fact that she has to see so many of her classmates go to their like parents is funeral and she's seeing so many people flee abroad in this really bad situation all of that i mean i don't think it's not reliable i just think it's she's telling us whatever she sees simply that's what i think anna um okay so one thing that i find really you know interesting about reading this book is that you see um you see a a, a very childish perspective in a lot and that's a good thing because she is a child right um at, at a lot of points you see her not really grasping the magnitude of the situation around her like um there's that point where she's just like oh my friends and i like uh, communism now so we're going to pretend to be revolutionaries and play and then another point yeah, where they like demonstrate in yeah. the garden <laughs> and then uh, we that kid's dad was you know uh, accused of doing something wrong so now we will punish him by like stabbing him with yeah, nails yeah, and yeah, things yeah. like that beating him yeah. yeah and mm-hmm. i think that's that's something that's very stark to me because when you're a kid and you have things just going on around you you just take that in and then like that's that's the world around you and that's what you have to deal with and i don't mean deal with in like i mean of course there's a a lot of trauma that's probably yeah. attached to that but at the same time the way that you think about things the way that you play and things like that when you're a kid it is determined by the context that you are placed within and um i think persepolis does a really good job of representing that um and i think uh when when you're a kid right if there are so many things going around you um it's not easy to think of all of that at the same time um i think you see that a lot in how a lot of characters are just introduced and then they just then, then you never hear of them again um and that's a very that's that's a, what a child's world is like because yeah. there's so much change there's so yeah. many things just going on that something comes something goes and then it, that's just how it is uh, another thing i really like is how uh, maji perceives a lot of these class relations around her mm-hmm. um the thing with uh, the maid that they have at Not that place them, yeah. mm-hmm. um and like i think she said maid the one who raises who, who sort yeah, of plays with her and then she writes yeah, love yeah. letters for them and Mary, stuff yeah mary yeah. yeah. mary is never mentioned again yeah she yeah. is never mentioned yeah. again um and that's sort of the whole world of it that everything keeps changing and then sort it's very yeah it's very hard for a kid to sort of remember everything i think i was watching this video um with Ma- majin satrapi talking about this whole situation and um uh, one thing she said was this isn't a- autobiographical because i can't say that these are all facts i don't remember if this is exactly how all the conversations went and uh, if this is the things i said and it, this was what was said to me but i think the fact that it is sort of presenting a very full picture but at the same time a kids version of it devi you know like sami tends to do she says something and like suddenly everything <laughs> makes sense so when she mentioned that formal operational stage thing it all clicked for me that's a perfect explanation for um, the way marji like narrates things mm-hmm. when she's nine compared to like how she narrates it when she's older in mm-hmm. persepolis too so um she doesn't have a lot of nuance on the situation you know uh, there's this one part where i think her i don't think she's her friend 
but she is the child of a political prisoner and they come over to their house and she is kind of jealous of how much time yeah, her fa- yeah. her friend's father has spent in the prison mm-hmm. but when her uncle anush comes and you know tells her his stories the one of the first things she thinks of is uh, oh he has probably spent yeah. more time in prison than that girl <laughs> than that girl's father yeah and uh, she does not quite grasp the intensity of the situation and so in that way i would say that marji is an unreliable na- mm-hmm. narrator mm-hmm. but at the same time um i googled marjan satrapati yesterday because i became kind of obsessed with her you know i was looking up i was looking her up in all her socials i know i mean i looked her up on google images and like like i usually do with anyone <laughs> but anyway um i found this interview emma watson took of her oh. for the vogue magazine and i don't have a screenshot of the question because i was too fixated on the answer but it was similar to your question anna um about how like you know there's this onus on this book for you know explaining the events of mm-hmm. the iranian the islamic revolution in iran and marjan says that um i'll just directly quote it i didn't have any other way to write about my story I could not suddenly say oh this is an analysis of what happened in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s in Iran because I'm not a historian and I'm not a politician I'm a person who was born in a certain place in a certain time and I can be unsure about everything but I'm not unsure of what I have lived I know it and that's what makes Persephone is like it she is an unreliable narrator yes but um does that make persepolis less, less historically important as a text on the islamic revolution absolutely not i think uh, from that response mm-hmm. of that question is you know it is a personal narrative yeah. to satrapi and there's this idea of the personal is political which i agree with mm-hmm. i agree that the personal is political but us reading it as a political book mm-hmm. is us doing it and mm-hmm. for satrapi it's very well that this is a personal, personal narrative exactly. and it's her life and that's all that it is for her stories often reflect the context within which they are told and persepolis while being an autobiographical account is deeply political in how it con- chronicles the islamic revolution in iran So what do you guys think is the scope of this novel in interpreting the political climate of today? Devi Um I'm going to preface this by saying that I may not be aware of like everything that's going on in Iran right now. Um there's a lot and um I wouldn't want to like dump all the facts here mm-hmm. and or like speak over other and people. speak over other people's experiences. Mm-hmm. But the main similarity in the what in what i'm seeing in the books and what's happening in iran right now um there's obviously the big rebellions and the revolution you know where you go out there and actively protest against uh, the regime and you know get things done and i'm not discrediting its importance but at the same time um it made me realize that there's also like a smaller very natural kind of protest and that's just simply like living your life mm-hmm. um expressing human joy for example um in the book in persepolis 2 um they tend to have uh, secret parties where mm-hmm. they drink and then yeah. the women are without their hijab and um um it's obviously like banned in iran so they have to do it very covertly and during one party i think someone snitches on them and then um you know uh, the morality police come to like um investigate, investigate the yeah and uh, so the men they go upstairs to like flush down the wine and also like escape by jumping over roofs uh, roofs of houses and uh, in doing so um like the police are in their house in doing so one of her friends falls to his death mm-hmm. yeah and uh, and they're obviously busted and they're taken in and their parents have to pay to like um mm-hmm. release them uh, but uh, the next thing marji does is that she has another party where she drinks more than she has ever in her life and it kind of relates to like certain videos i'm seeing in iran so um i saw this video yesterday of this father of a martyr um who uh, who was killed by the regime and it was his birthday so his father's dancing on his grave 
holding a birthday cake and he's singing he's dancing and obviously like when you say i'm dancing on i'm going to dance on your grave when you die, when you die it's like something insulting but this was like an expression of human joy you know he was he was just celebrating his son's birthday by dancing publicly which is also like a taboo in iran and i've seen video this video of like a woman just riding a motorcycle with her hair unbound and mm-hmm. women just going to malls with their friends with their uh, hair out in the open and i feel like that sort of rebellion is it reflected very well in the book you know just just living your life just expressing human joy sami yeah that gave me a lot of ideas this one is kind of on the like o- almost opposite but mm-hmm. uh, a spectrum of the kind of events going on in the book but one thing is so basically in 2022 there was this um uh entire it's not a situation there mm-hmm. was a ruling um that where the events that triggered it started in uh, 2022 where some girls uh in the udpi district of mm-hmm. karnataka they were going to school and they were stopped because they were wearing a hijab mm-hmm. and uh they filed they were about to give an exam if yeah, i remember yeah yeah they were about to give an exam and yeah. they the school stopped them they said this your hijab does not adhere to the dress code and um they filed a complaint and it escalated and what ended up happening is um there was there was a ruling that any institution can stop its students from wearing a hijab mm-hmm. or can uh, not allow them in if they are wearing a hijab or any sort of head covering or head scarf because these sort of head scarves are religious um kind mm-hmm. of religious symbols. uh symbols and you know the education system is supposed to be a secular one what so they said that you can stop kids mm-hmm. from wearing this but a lot of people interpreted that as a ban mm-hmm. and especially a lot of hindu right wing organizations they force the schools that they were going to to interpret it as a ban they said that but the uh, the court has said that it's it's not allowed mm-hmm. and that's how we think it is so we also are forcing you to stop the mm-hmm. uh, the hijabi students from um dressing so and what i felt at least within my friend groups maybe this also has something to do with us being a little older but a lot of my muslim friends started wearing their hijabs more mm-hmm. and i thought that was that was really that was really great and that was really powerful of mm. you know you you're going to i'm doing this thing and you're trying to stop me and i'm going to do it more do it more yeah <laughs> and i feel this way about a lot of issues not related to religion or um i feel this way with issues related to queerness and gender expression mm. where if someone tells me no mm. and it's not it's not just like reverse psychology of i want to disobey you it's i know that y- what you are saying is like discriminatory and mm-hmm. it's not based on any logical reasoning so i'm going to push you mm-hmm. and i think that's such a powerful that's such a powerful image but it's such a powerful thing for us as a mm-hmm. society and for yeah. us as humans to do is, it's such a childish concept right you're not telling me to do this i'm going to do it more but it becomes so powerful yeah. at the end of the day like these little actions of just like doing that yeah. thing mhm mhm uh anna um Okay so what I'm going to talk about is I think a long a different tangent because I don't believe myself to be as informed about you know mm-hmm. the exact political environment and everything that's going on but um within the book I think uh, especially in volume 2 when um Maji goes to Vienna and she's surrounded by all of these people who are so fascinated by the fact that she's been touched by war and suffering in some way mm-hmm. that they sort of make that her whole personality mm-hmm. that they will w- whenever there's discussions about death they're so interested in the just they like, like her because yeah, she's seen death and because they're like you have suffered which that sarpach kid is one of those people yeah. Momo. Yeah. Momo. not sarpach the sarpach Sar- 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 Momo yeah. guy we hate him we, we hate, hate him yeah. <laughs> and he's not a real person he yeah, is a real person like yeah. it's all about I mean the representation of you within this book is very hateable. You can just say you hate him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And um it's a thing where 
they're very obsessed to the fact that she comes from the third world so it's sort of like oh this guy is into this sort of philosophy this girl does this but for maji it's like she's from a third world country and her country saw war and that's that's basically the entirety of her mm-hmm. and i think there was some class that we were talking about this i think it was in the last semester where um it's sort of about if you're from a community that's i don't know marginalized in any way it's that like you're ed- your yeah. Yeah. yeah we were talking about how like uh, a lot of dalit people mm. in in academia yeah. only asked about like yeah. dalit related issues yeah i think that's something that happens to maji a lot and another thing is um i think with maji coming to vienna and she comes there to stay with her mom's best friend mm-hmm. and uh, the first thing she does is like at the airport she meets her mom's best friend's daughter and she just feels so disgusted and disconnected from her because um maji she she talks about what she's been through and this like her i mean i mean they're friends with each other she's just she sort of brushes it off and i think that's a thing that a lot of the other people she meets in vienna do that she starts talking about her culture or what she's been through and they just like talk over her like that point of time where uh, everyone's talking about you know their what christmas plans christmas? Yeah. and then she's like in my country we do this and they just like ignore her yeah. they just don't talk and i think that sort of disconnect is something that you see a lot um i know that we we're, we're also from like what you'd call a third world country yeah. and but it it's sort of like um the context within which you talk about suffering or any sort of injustice that is going on in the world and what sort of relevance you give it in the context that you give it relevance in and when you give it that importance what sort of conversations you have around it and um uh, another like she she comes back and she vows to never talk about what her life in vienna was like right because it's just a thought of my parents are suffering so much mm-hmm. while my struggles over yeah. i think it, it's just it like volume 2 especially gives you such an interesting case study on being away from your home and assimilating to a new culture especially when a lot of times you just feel like i want to put my past behind me i don't want to be connected to that but there's one scene where maji just she she stands up and she's she's proud of the fact that she's, she's yeah she yeah, shouts yeah. at those people who are being very I think they're being very xenophobic, xenophobic. Yeah. and yeah devi connecting to that um in persepolis too when she returns to iran she feels this sort of guilt that she wasn't mm-hmm. there during when her family and her the people in her country were facing so much mm-hmm. but um there's this very interesting like you know what can i say good cognitive dissonance in her mm-hmm. mind where she's like um i she wants to feel sad mm-hmm. like she feels angry and she feels sad but at the same time um does she have the right to feel mm-hmm. those you know considering that she was not in the mm-hmm. country um for so long she feels like that she cannot talk about her own struggles in vienna you know like becoming homeless and yeah. getting bronchitis um because you know her suffering isn't as much Uh, to her it's not as important yeah. individual suffering versus collective suffering mm-hmm. coming from a collectivist culture and she's in a yeah. more individualistic yeah. culture yeah. when she yeah. comes to vienna yeah about guilt with having done something for yourself or having done something right mm-hmm. um i don't know how connected this is to the point that you are trying to make mm-hmm. but there was this scene i think this was the first scene where i was like crying where i was mm-hmm. just reading the book casually like oh english class i'm reading this book it's kind of cool but then i was crying in this scene mm-hmm. and it was let me just pull this up which version should i pull this up in french english <laughs> take your pick um french because i love listening to you <laughs> french. talking french okay too. i will i will get the french version so um marjie's imaginary friend is god <laughs> which i think is a great imaginary friend but at one point the revolution is kind of um like intensifying and then something really terrible happens i think it was the rex um theater being burnt down, down yeah and then her parents she overhears her parents mm-hmm. trying to pers- uh, uh discussing that they're going to protest and her as a 9 year old she's like 
I'm I want I, you know I am a communist and I'm going to help support this protest and this is the right thing to do as an honorable citizen mm. and so she she declares that I'm going to join this protest and um then all this time she was discussing with god about you know all of these um all of these thing uh, th- becoming a prophet but then later it became more and more about the political situation and then god felt like god her imaginary friend felt like she was <laughs> neglecting him and her uh, uh f- destiny as a prophet and so when she declares that i'm going to join you in the protest there is this moment where her father says says uh no you can't you, uh, you can come here later then she's like uh no you're never going to let me you'll only let me join when it's over please 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 let me come mm. and then he's like oh lord uh ali tu vas te coucher maintenant now you go to bed right now and she's like please 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 let me and then there's this shot where she's in her bed there's mm. this panel she's in her bed and she's like god where are you but he doesn't that night he didn't he come i think that's also kind of guilt where mm-hmm. she, her she feels that there is a conflict between her doing what her faith tells her and her doing what she knows is right uh, between forgiving people and having an open heart versus acknowledging the kind of trauma that she's been through mm-hmm. and i think it makes persepolis a very emotional but also that much of a powerful read do check out the links in the show notes for the fundraisers and other resources about the situation in iran don't forget to follow us at wrw.podcast on instagram and at wrw_podcast on twitter you can write to us at womenrwomen22@gmail.com The links to all things discussed will be in the show notes. We will also be taking a short break next week on account of a different project that we're covering. You can also check that out on our Instagram. Happy listening. Bye. Bye. Cue <laughs> outro music.